at Chernobyl. At Chernobyl, they hired, they paid huge amounts of money to the Germans to provide robots to go in there and remove the, the, the pieces of fuel, and the robots just packed up. They didn't work, because under those radiation fields, the electrons, the, the electronics don't work. So you have to use people. Unfortunately, I don't think that even with the people, there's much that they can do. The thing is out of control, and we have a sort of science fiction scenario now. I think it's going to be very, very bad for Japan. And right from the beginning, we weren't being told everything. And this is one thing that happened with Chernobyl as well. The, that, that is another parallel between these two situations, is that we don't get told anything, and, when, and, and the, the truth slowly comes out as if it's being dragged out of people. This is certainly going to... In my opinion, it's going to finish the north of Japan off. I don't see what they can do about it. They're going to have a very large exclusion zone. The cost is going to be absolutely phenomenal. So the nuclear industry, I think, is finished. But then I thought that after Chernobyl, to be honest. And what happened there was that there was a massive cover-up, an international cover-up by the nuclear lobby of all the health effects of the Chernobyl accident, which is only just coming out now. We now know, as a result of research, that at least a million people have died as a result of the Chernobyl accident. Yet we still have the nuclear industry telling us that only a few liquidators died and there really wasn't any problem except thyroid cancer in a few children. And that can be cured. That was a pack of lies, and I think we're going to get another pack of lies after this, so people should watch out. At the start we were told not to worry there was containment. But as the results came in this was harder to deny. By now it is obvious that it is not only out of control, with huge radiation releases. But it is also going to harm many people. Just like Chernobyl where it, it was covered up extensively throughout Europe. This disaster is following the same tried and tested apparatus but now it was too big to deny any longer. The accident uh, continues uh, to be a serious situation and it is not yet over. Uh, what uh, we can expect is uh, the preliminary assessment of um, uh, the accident and a preliminary review of um, uh, the safety um, standard in light of this accident. It is not to open everything, but in light of this um, uh, accident and um, um, preliminary review of uh, the response again to this accident. My understanding is that uh, the situation continue to be very serious and um, uh, the efforts to overcome this crisis is increasing. At the same time, um, they, they encounter difficulties uh, like uh, the existence of uh, water uh, or high level of um, uh, radiation. Uh, I really hope uh, that uh, the efforts by the emergency workers um, uh, would um, lead uh, to the stabilization of uh, the reactors and this accident and crisis situation. Everything we knew about that accident has been turned upside down. We were told three partial meltdowns, don't worry about it. Now we know it was 100% core melt in all three reactors. Radiation, minimal that was released. Now we know it was comparable to the radiation at Chernobyl. And as far as evacuation, yeah, 12 miles, that's it. You don't have to evacuate beyond 12 miles. Now they find hot spots, four hot spots outside the evacuation zone. 34,000 school children now have radiation badges when they go to school with radiation down to badges. four years of age can you imagine that kindergarten kids with radiation badges going to school i'm a physicist and we tried to reconstruct the accident in our computers given the feeble amount of information they gave us we knew it was much more severe than they were saying because radiation was coming out left and right so in other words they lied to us they knew how much radiation was coming out, they knew the danger, they knew how much core melting was taking place, but they tried to put a happy face on it. I don't know, it was like the Keystone Cops. People that are clueless, headless, just running around crazy, not knowing what to do. We can now reconstruct that accident minute by minute, hour by hour, and we can see this chaos that erupted in the leadership of the utility. Let's take a look at the failures at the plant on the day of the earthquake. This is what a nuclear reactor looks like. The uranium inside the fuel rod inside the reactor undergoes nuclear fission. The rods emit heat, generating energy. Usually water cools them to maintain their temperature at 270 degrees Celsius. But if the cooling fails, the temperature could rise to over 1200 degrees. 
this temperature is hot enough to melt the fuel rods. When the earthquake hit, the first safety system to prevent a meltdown was activated. Control rods rose into the reactor to stop the nuclear fission. As planned, the reactor stopped operating. But the fuel rods were still hot. Water should have been circulated to cool them down. However, this didn't happen because of a power outage right after the quake. So the second safety system turned on. The emergency diesel power generator began spraying the rods with coolant. But, an hour later, something unexpected happened. Without warning, the emergency generator stopped. Around this time, the tsunami, possibly as high as 10 meters, hit the power plant. Experts think this is what caused the generator to fail. Now, the third safety system started operating. It converts steam traveling through the pipes into water. It cools the rods, but the water level went down and the temperature continued to rise. All three safety measures had failed. As the crisis deepened, the infighting in the utility and the government led to a resignation and severe claims from a senior Japanese nuclear advisor. Senior nuclear advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister is resigning, alleging the government ignored his safety advice. Toshisho Kosako said the wrong radiation limits were set for his schools near the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, endangering children's lives. The Japanese government denies the claims, insisting it followed expert advice. The plant has been releasing... By now there can be no doubt that this is a world issue. The true scope of the disaster five months on is horrendously apparent. Uh, we know now that the, there have been three meltdowns at the reactors uh, at this six-unit site and that uh, the vessel has failed. Uh, now what seems to be the situation is that, is that this corium, this melted reactor uh, core, has burned through the concrete floor of the reactor building or buildings and has now uh, burned into the uh, earth and reaching groundwater is creating steam and uh, what the readings we're seeing uh, now suggest that it's off scale for the um, instrumentation that's being used by workers which is 10 sieverts per hour uh, so right now it looks like the, the 10,000 millisieverts it's uh, it's one million um, uh, millirem it's uh, 500, so 500 rem is a lethal dose. This is 1,000 rem coming out of these cracks. So we're seeing, um, you know, doses that could cause fatalities within Let's days. Just, just but now it's coming up out of the ground through cracks around the facility. So the, um, the accident is now, you know, clearly much more seriously out of control than they're willing to admit. It's escaped into the... the that fuel fragments found over one and a half miles away from the facility uh, did not come from explosions from the fuel pool, from those spent fuel pools up on top of the reactor buildings that we've been talking about. These were fuel... According to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, those fuel fragments were ejected from the reactor cores in those explosions. Wow. So the first thing to be controlled in these nuclear accidents is the information. And now, 160 days after, into this accident, and still worsening, we still see that the information is being withheld. Uh, it, that there's an incredible lag time, certainly inherently dangerous. And once it's out of control, the consequences are unacceptable. There is always a strong effort to minimize a public understanding about what that accident is and the reason is seen as uh, that minimizing public anxiety and panic is an important thing but the trade-off obviously in this case and in all these cases is that you increase the risk to public health and the exposures of citizens to radiation um, so uh, 
it, that information should have been given to people immediately so that people can make the right decision. People with young children who are particularly vulnerable to radiation exposures uh, because their bodies are growing rapidly would be able to make the decision to move those children out of those areas or pregnant women would be able to move out of those areas. But from a cynical point of view, you could say that it was successful public relations because at the time that three nuclear power plants melted down, what the press largely was saying was, can the, uh, can the government and the company get it under control? Well, that, that was not an option. It was not, it, you know, they had melted down. So when that happened, the press was hopeful that it could be brought under control. And then when the news finally emerges that three plants had melted down, uh, it's essentially not on the media radar anymore because it's months later. So from a public relations point of view, that's successful. However, from a public health point of view, it's disastrous. So after months of wondering how bad this accident was, we are left with no doubt to the severity. DEPCO and the Japanese government have indeed had a cynically successful PR campaign. When the information finally makes it out, people are not really paying attention. A probable damage limitation tactic. We go back to Professor Busby, who tells us of his findings on the ground in Tokyo. As you probably know, my opinion is nuclear power itself is an extremely dangerous process and that you cannot really um, believe that you can cage these things and expect them not to come out, you know, not to have these sorts of accidents and other accidents will occur in the future. I've actually visited there and I've taken uh, quite sophisticated radiation measuring equipment and I've been able to, to satisfy myself that the concentrations of radionuclides on the ground, even as far as 100 and more kilometers away from the plant, are very much higher than they've been saying. And indeed, some measurements that I've been making on air filters from vehicles from as far away as Tokyo show that the concentrations of cesium-137, for example, in these filters is more than 1,000 times higher than, uh, in terms of air concentration than the air concentration at the peak of the weapons fallout in 1963. So we're talking about serious, serious levels of radioactive nuclides. And the problem is that, that, that this is effectively being ignored by, by, by the authorities concentrating on the external dose rate. So they say, so long as the external dose rate is not more than so many microsieverts per hour or whatever it happens to be, everybody's going to be safe. In some sense, they're comparing it with natural background radiation. But actually, it cannot be compared with natural background radiation. The the, the, there's a very, very high level of contamination, even as far south as Tokyo. For example, we found one sample in Tokyo that had levels of radioactivity higher than levels inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone. It's a very serious matter. Well, the fact that steam is coming out, uh, and, and we know from measurements made in California that the steam contains uh, the isotope sulfur-35, this isotope is associated with neutron irradiation of chlorine. Uh, and so what we've got here is a situation where you've got fission taking place, an enormous neutron concentration, neutron flux, and seawater. Uh, and, 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 and effectively, we're producing very large quantities of radionuclides all the time, and they haven't been able to deal with that. I was told by somebody who, who'd heard this from a TEPCO official who was talking to the Prime Minister of Japan, who said that the releases from the plant are now of the order of 10 to the power 13 becquerels every hour. So we're, we're talking about something that is absolutely ongoing and it's just, it's just being ignored. It's, being, it's, being, it's not being adequately reported by the authorities in Japan or indeed in the atom, International Atomic Energy okay. Agency. More. What's it saying, Frank? There's nothing like we've had before. We're heading for ground zero of Japan's nuclear crisis, the meltdown of Fukushima power plant. Okay, stop there. It's more than 20 kilometers away, but already we're picking up its deadly fallout. The radiation is building the further we go in, so it's going to be too dangerous to carry on. So we, we actually have to stop here? Yep. I'm not willing to take you any further. Radiation expert Frank Jackson and his Geiger counters tell us we have already come too far. So even, even um, protective gear is not enough? Gamma radiation is... Um, it's a stronger form of radiation. It, it will go through most things apart from lead. Okay, so that's the sort of radiation we want to avoid. It is, yeah. Okay. Radiation covers large parts of the Fukushima prefecture. Only the Geiger counter's signals indicate any danger. A silent and deadly killer. A killer that has ousted tens of thousands of people. Who now call wherever they can home.
More than 135,000 people have been forced to evacuate. The streets in towns and villages are now mostly deserted. And locals have been told their food and water may be contaminated. Shall we test these? Mm. Same as an x-ray then, according to this. Okay. 